Hello, my name is Andy and I am the Village Idiot. I'm armed with a car and a GoPro and an unhealthy amount of time on my hands. I'm using that time to attempt to visit every civil parish in England. You're watching the East Riding of Yorkshire series. Together with the unparished city of Hull, it forms the county of the same name. There's 172 parishes here. Which one are we in today? Welcome back to the East Riding of Yorkshire people for the 171st and final time. Behind me, you can see there the County Hall, which is owned and run by the East Riding of Yorkshire Council. The ideal place to begin the final episode. Welcome to the town of Beverly. Here's my disclaimer for people who may be watching me for the first time. I say things as I would in my native accent and dialect. As a result, I may not pronounce things in the same way as the locals do. Remember, I'm a visitor. It's impossible to know everything. Leave me a comment, spin me a like and bash that subscribe button. Let's get to today's parish video. Beverly, Beaver Stream. Ladies and gentlemen, after almost four years, the East Riding of Yorkshire is almost complete. We've got one left, and for the grand finale, we're in Beverly. You don't get much grander than this, by the way. Beverly is a thriving market town whose history goes back centuries. We've already learnt so much about it from previous episodes around the town, but this video will tie all of that together and then some. The town was founded in the 7th century by John of Beverly, who established a church in the area. It was originally named Indira Wuda and was part of the Anglian Kingdom of Northumbria. Under Viking control in the 850s, Beverly then became part of the Kingdom of England. John of Beverly was made a saint in 1037 and the town was a place of pilgrimage for the remainder of the Middle Ages. It continued to grow under the Normans when its trading industry was first established and eventually became a significant wool trading town. Its historical importance is only magnified when you consider that this was once the 10th largest settlement in England. It inspired the naming of the city of Beverly, Massachusetts, which in turn was the indirect source of the name for Beverly Hills, California. So here we go, for the final time in the East Riding of Yorkshire, the 171st time no less. Let's get to work. Now before we can get into Beverly Town Centre, the main walk and all that kind of stuff, there are some other things that I need to cover on the outskirts of the town. I'm currently standing on something called Westwood Pasture and there in the distance you can see perhaps its biggest and most obvious landmark. That is called the Black Mill. Great place to begin. This is the Black Mill, one of the most iconic of all the Beverly landmarks. It was built in 1803 and originally its exterior was whitewashed before it was tarred, giving it its dark appearance today. The mill is the only one remaining of the six that once occupied Westwood Pasture in the 1850s. Five of them were corn mills and the sixth was a whiting mill. The Black Mill was damaged by a fire in 1868 and eventually its working gear was dismantled. For a short time it then became a residence. Also, this has often been a centre for social activities, particularly with cricketers in the Victorian period. Westwood Pasture is one of the best areas of common land anywhere in the country. The Westwood, as it's commonly known, was among several areas of land granted to the locals by the Lord of the Manor way back in 1380. Today, residents still hold rights to graze cattle and sheep here, a practice which is overseen by so-called pasture makers. 
It does have some rules to abide by, but as common land, anyone and everyone is allowed on it. So around the base of the Black Mill, there's a handy little bench where you can just sit and admire the view. And there is a cracking view here, to be honest with you. And you can't really hear much in the way of noise either, because even though Beverly is quite a, a busy, bustling town, be a busy market town, there's none of that out here. It's just peacefulness more than anything else. You can just occasionally hear the traffic in the distance and, you know, the, the occasional golf ball being thwacked by a driver, I suppose. But that's basically it. Lots of people choose to, you know, walk around on this because they can. It, you're allowed to, you know, it's a massive area of common land and you have absolutely every right to enjoy the peace, peace and the, uh, the quiet out here. Now, if you sit at the bottom of this, the Black Mill, you'll also see another major Beverly landmark in the distance. If I turn the camera around, you might just be able to see it. I don't know whether you can. It doesn't matter if you can't, because we're about to go to it. Over there is Beverly Racecourse. Even the most casual of horse racing fans will know that Beverly has a racecourse, and this is it. It's one of the town's most famous landmarks. Racing in Beverly can be documented as far back as 300 years ago with the founding of a jockey club in 1752. Occasional racing took place on Westwood Pasture at that time. When the racecourse was founded, it held an annual meeting, first run officially in 1767. For a short period, all racing here stopped, but its popularity returned in the 19th century, where a three-day event took place annually in the week after the May meeting at York. Beverly's two most prestigious races are protected by law. These are the Hillary Needler Trophy, run in May, and the Beverly Bullet Sprint, run over five furlongs in August. The racecourse itself is a right-handed flat course and has a length of just over one mile, three furlongs. It's noted for its stiff uphill finish and tight turns, and it has the most pronounced draw bias of any racecourse in the country. It's been described by commentators in the past as unpretentious but agreeable, which I think is a compliment. Its first grandstand was commissioned in 1767. Ten horses have died here since 2007. And if you stand in the right place outside the racecourse, you can see the Black Mill in the distance. Hopefully you can see it there in this shot. So we're done with Beverly Westwood, and as good as this is, this definitely isn't the be-all and end-all as far as Beverly's concerned. Oh no. This place is one of the most historic in the East Riding of Yorkshire, and indeed in the entire country. This arch on Figham Road marked the entrance to Beverly Gasworks, which was in operation from 1826. The works supplied much of Beverly's gas until the late 1960s, when it was replaced by supplies from the North Sea. In 2006, it was redeveloped into a block of 31 apartments called Millview Court. Beckside next, as we head west into the town centre. It's quite a walk away from here, but there's lots to discuss en route. Beckside is named for the Beverly Beck, a short canal that runs alongside the road at this point. Close to these flats is a small square, where we can get a look at it. Beverly Beck gives boats access to the town from the River Hull. It's primarily used by fishermen these days, but from a historical standpoint, this canal was much more important than that. Beverly was a trading post of the Hanseatic League, and the Beck was a key part of the town's transport network, as it grew in importance as a centre for the wool trade. You'll often see barges on the Beck. In fact, there were some just out of shot at this point. The Beverly Barge Preservation Society is based here too. All of this and more is explained on a handy information board by the water's edge. This statue is that of a medieval creeler. Creelers worked on the Beck. Their job was to unload barges and carry goods into the town centre. Now that sounds like hard work to me, so one would hope they had some refreshment. The nearby Sloop Inn provides some today. This pub's name comes from the type of vessel that was commonly used both on the Beck and on the River Hull. The pub is considered to be 18th century and it's Grade 2 listed. Quite often it's described as one of Beverly's most attractive inns, with simple lines and a lack of unnecessary decoration and signage. Now let's head on to Fleming Gate. Okay, a few more paces and Beckside becomes Fleming Gate, which is what we're currently on now. Now behind me there you can see a building which is currently a bedding centre. Looks like an old chapel to me, not totally sure if it is, but there is an old chapel, literally just a few more steps that way. Let's check that one out, shall we? The chapel in question here is Wesleyan in origin. This replaced a previous chapel that stood on Blucher Lane from 1825. 
Fleming Gate Chapel was built in 1882, whilst Blucher Lane was sold the same year and later demolished. This was later enlarged with a schoolroom and could seat 250 people. Now we're heading towards a property which used to be known as Fleming House. It was an early 19th century villa that was latterly used as the recreation club of a nearby Tanners. After standing derelict for a while, today it's known as the Potting Shed, but it used to be called Hodgson's. And the reason it had that name is all to do with the Fleming Gate Shopping Centre. In late 2015, this brand new shopping and entertainment complex opened on the site of the old Hodgson's Tannery. Among its attractions, there's a six screen cinema and a Premier Inn hotel. It's all a far cry from the Tannery days. Hodgson's was a major employer in the town. When it closed in 1979, there were 750 redundancies. For a time, part of the Tannery site was used by a chemical production company called Clarent. That had closed by 2005. Now, Fleming Gate is once again thriving with modern business. Beverly had two tanneries, in fact. The other was on Keldgate, and it was called Melrose Tanners and previously Cussons. That closed in 1986. Now we're heading over the railway line towards not just one, but two pubs, which sit in the shadow of the biggest building in Beverly. First up is the Lord Nelson. One of the town's oldest, it was likely established as an inn as early as 1620, but only appeared in trade directories with its current name from 1814. And said to be haunted just up the street is the Sun Inn, formerly known as the Tabard. This is Beverly's oldest pub, it's 15th century. Now if you stand here on this corner opposite the Sun Inn, there can be no denying what the next major landmark is. It's tall enough, let's be honest. It's right behind me there, it's Beverly Minster and it makes a racket with its bells, let me tell you. Beverly Minster is one of the largest parish churches in the UK, bigger than one third of all the country's cathedrals. A grade one listed building, it's regarded as a Gothic masterpiece and it's dedicated to St John and St Martin. Originally a collegiate church, it owes much of its origin and subsequent importance to St John of Beverly, the Bishop of York in the early 8th century. His remains lie in a vault beneath the nave, making the Minster a major place of pilgrimage. Most of the building dates from between 1188 and 1420, but there was almost certainly a smaller church here before then. Over the road is Hall Garth, an expanse of earthworks which mark the site of a moated residence where the Archbishops of York lived. Effectively, it was a manor house or a small castle. The site has a small, sub-rectangular moat surrounding a central island. The moat is visible on three sides of the central island, but the western arm has since been infilled. During the early 14th century, a timber bridge was built across the moat, although it's theorised that could have been a drawbridge instead. Next, it's the Minstergarth Hotel, in the news for all the wrong reasons just lately. See the link below. Keldgate now, and this is loaded with a ridiculous amount of listed buildings. That big white one is the former Keldgate Manor Care Home, which is now apartments. Opposite that are Anne Routh's Almshouses, designed by James Moyser and built in around 1749 by Thomas Wrightson. Not far away from those are a pair of identical gate lodges which form numbers 45 and 47 Keldgate, and directly opposite these are more almshouses, this time much more modern ones. There are several other areas of the town with charitable housing in them. These are just the tip of a very large iceberg. You could make a pretty lengthy video about all the properties on Keldgate, to be honest with you, because there's loads of interest. Here's another one. You can see here, this is an old schoolhouse. And the reason I know it's an old schoolhouse is because there's a little plaque on this wall here. And that states that the oldest parts of this building date from the reign of Charles II. And it contains two fine staircases within its walls. Next up is the Tiger Inn on Lairgate. Known as the Black Bull in 1746, its name was changed following the closure of the more famous Tiger Inn pub on North Bar Within. In the 1860s and 70s it had a shop, believed by some to have been Beverly's first ever off licence. A few more steps and we're at a green on the left hand side. Follow the road south from here and you'll end up near Beverly Grammar School. Northwards, the next landmark is the Memorial Hall, which honours the townsfolk who were lost in World War II. Opened as such in 1959, originally it was a chapel of ease to Beverly Minster. Speaking of halls, check this one out. This building is early 18th century and it was lived in by the Wharton family. Sir James Pennyman later acquired the property, remodelled it and extended it. The hall is now an office complex, stretching to some 25,000 square feet. 
Humberside Police use part of it today. Now we're on Central Avenue heading into a residential area. There's not a great deal to say about this road, but at the end of it there's a park. Seen as a vital community asset today, in medieval times the ancient sport of archery would have been practiced right here, hence its name, Archery Field. There's a school down here as well. That there is Beverly Minster C of E, tucked away on the corner of Ellica Road. Now we need to head north, and to do that we need a road called the Leases, which becomes Albert Terrace. In the 1980s, when new Walkergate was built, Beverly's fire station relocated there from here. The smaller, old fire station is now this GP surgery. Now at this point I wandered down Albert Terrace 10 foot. I didn't find what I was looking for here, but I promise this does exist. Within these terraces somewhere there's a stone coffin, which dates back to 1843. So yesterday when I filmed Beverly Westwood and the race course, I used this road here to get between the two. That's Westwood Road. If you go out there, that'll take you towards the Black Mill where we began this uh, episode. Now, if you go the other way, obviously you're heading into the, the town centre. We'll gonna turn around here. This is a one-way street that's called New Beggin. And already I can see there's something of interest on this street. There's a plaque just there. I've no idea what it says, but we're about to find out. This is the site of the former New Biggin Bar. It was one of the five gates or bars that crossed the town moat. The bars marked the boundary of the ancient town and acted as its first line of defence. Only one bar now remains. New Biggin Bar was built between 1409 and 1410 and was demolished in 1812. Now New Biggin is a one-way street. It's similar to Kelgate in that it has loads of historic buildings, a lot of which are listed. New Biggin House is one such property. It's a grand three-storey mansion built in 1746. It was the home of the Sweeney family, who still have a hand in its modern day usage. Today, New Biggin House is a five star gold B&B, which is often featured in the likes of the Good Hotel Guide. It has three guest rooms and a large, peaceful garden. Now, directly opposite the end of New Biggin is an alleyway with a great name, Narrow Racket. It was first recorded on maps as Narrow Lane in 1409. The name Racket is a reference to the dodgy, unscrupulous, unsavoury deals and rackets that often went on in such a back alley. It leads to the Saturday Marketplace, but that's coming later. Next for us, we're off at Blairgate again, this time towards another pub called the Cross Keys. A fine building dating from the mid-1760s, it's recorded that coaches once ran here from Hull. Outside there was stabling for 20 horses with rented adjoining accommodation for a further 30. Today it's a Weatherspoons pub and they've tastefully preserved its history with pictures and information on its walls. Now we're at the start of the historic North Bar. This is North Bar Within, a street name which literally means the part of North Bar that's within the ancient boundary of the town. There is also a tiny street called North Bar Without too, on the other side of the boundary. Now, when it comes to Beverly's religious buildings, it's not just all about the Minster. This particular church you can see behind me here, we have mentioned before back in the Molescroft episode. You remember, we walked through a cemetery there, and this is the church which is related to it. St Mary's Church is a fantastic building, but often gets criminally overlooked due to the presence of Beverly Minster. Sir Tatton Sykes once famously remarked that the West Front of St Mary's was unequalled in England and almost without rival on the continent of Europe. I think he was right. The West Front dates from the late 14th century, but St Mary's was founded in 1120. The foundations of that early Norman building can still be seen in places. This is perhaps best known for its beautifully carved pillars. The most famous among them is the Minstrel Pillar, which depicts musicians. Next is the Beverly Arms, which used to be known as the Blue Bell Inn. An inn known simply as the Bell was recorded here as early as 1686. It became a posting inn or house in the mid-19th century, where horses that pulled wagons or coaches could be hired or changed during long journeys. Dick Turpin stayed here once too. Over the road is a magnificent Victorian water pump, the last of its type that survives in the town today. Octagonal in shape and made of cast iron, it had lost its handle, spout and trough by the 1960s, but it remained fabulously elegant. It's since been restored to its full glory. This wonky looking 15th century building is St Mary's Court. It's exactly what it sounds like, a former courthouse, although it's been drastically altered now. Part of it is a small shopping centre, accessed via Tiger Lane. Now even though Beverly Westwood is common land, it has to be managed. 
on York Road is the Pasture Warden or Neithard's house. Zoe Bell has been the Neithard since 2018. Her appointment was historic. Bell was the first female to be given the job in over 800 years. Not far from the house are all the Westwoods bylaws, which have to be adhered to, and they're on display. You know, I took one look at this and I thought to myself, it's like the terms and conditions that you accept on the internet. Biggest lie online, that is. Everyone ticks that little box, having not read a single word of it, and I suppose it's the same with that. If you break a rule, you don't find out until afterwards, because you can't be bothered to read through that lot, can you? Okay, we're going to turn around at this point and head towards a big arch next, and this is potentially going to be the best part of this video. Another pub now, this is the Rose and Crown, which has had its current name since at least 1800. The building is far older than that though. Records from 1574 mention a tenement called the Bull on this site. With many rooms and stabling, it was often used for racehorses and their owners at Beverly Races, and for hunters out on the Westwood. Horse and pony sales often took place in its yard. Its original address was York Road, but it was drastically altered and refronted in 1931 to how it is now. Today it faces North Bar Without, and that brings us to an iconic Bevelovian landmark. This is North Bar, the only one of the five defensive gates that still stand around the town. The North Bar was built in the 15th century. Grade 1 listed, it's possible to drive through this, but traffic is limited to single file, and it's controlled by a set of lights. The bars acted as toll gates, but today there are no such charges to pass under it. However, should you pass under it, local legend says you must hold your breath. If not, the Beverly Devil, which features on one of its turrets, will come to life and jump down. The Devil was built by the cabinet maker James Elwell in 1893. This big building is the Conservative Club, whose history goes back to 1885. At that time, it was alternatively known as the Beverly Conservative Working Men's Club. This is Wiley's Road, which acts as a mini bypass around the town centre. Together with New Walkergate, it keeps traffic away from the centre of town. On Manor Road, linking the two, there's a couple of bits. One of them is a school, Beverly Manor Nursery, and the other is a modern health centre. Around the back of that is Hawthorne Court, a mental health facility. As we know already, that used to be in Walkington. Well, certainly a lot of pubs in Beverly. Here's another one. That's the Corner House, and it stands on a corner which I'm very familiar with because when I've been coming to the East Riding to do places like Ticton and North Frodingham and everywhere up towards Bridlington, basically, I come this way because it's the easiest way to get around Beverly. It's difficult to drive through the town centre. Using the bypass is definitely the easiest option. But this corner is where I'd usually turn to head towards places like that, and I'm sure lots of other people do that as well. Now. It's time to head into the town centre. Let's head towards Saturday Market. Next up is the bus station on the corner of Sow Hill Road. It's modest in comparison to some, perhaps, but it gets the job done still. By the way, given the shape of the North Bar's arch, buses serving Beverly once had to be shaped accordingly in order to fit under it. Even then, there wasn't a lot of clearance. Now we're right in the town centre, and this is Saturday Market. Today was a Saturday, so as you can imagine, it was pretty busy here. On non-market days, you can park in the marketplace. On Saturday, though, it's a no-go zone for vehicles. Signs are placed on its edge, warning you away. Beverly's Market is famous throughout the East Riding and beyond. The town was granted its market charter in 1128 by King Henry I. That makes it older than St Mary's Church. The market has over 120 stalls, with traders selling a variety of goods, including food, fruit, vegetables, baked goods, arts and crafts, and clothing. The market cross was designed by Shelton of Wakefield, and was built between 1711 and 1714 to replace an earlier one. It's supposed to be big enough for carriages to drive through it, apparently. It displays the arms of two town MPs, Queen Anne, and Beverly itself. Of course, Beverly is also like any other British town centre. It's got a few nice pubs and bars for a start. One of those is called Grapes. By a somewhat loose definition, this building has been a pub since at least 1851, colloquially known at times as the Push Inn. For a while, it was an apothecary and spirit merchant. Next door is the old Corn Exchange, dating from the 1880s. Originally, a butcher shamble stood here, designed by Samuel Smith and erected in 1753. Part of it was converted into a butter market in 1825. It later became the Picture Playhouse, where films were first shown in 1911. 
So it's still pretty early in the morning here. It's about eight o'clock now. and Most of the market is still being set up. We will be back here in a short while though, when it's in full swing. See exactly what it's like to walk around the market on a Saturday. I imagine it's quite busy. Let's continue though, through the town center. We've still got some other things to catch first. There's the King's Head Hotel, another pub which originated as an inn in the late 17th century, and it's said to have a resident ghost. It's recently been refurbished by Marston's to include 10 boutique bedrooms. We've reached the end of the marketplace now, but the town centre continues south onto Toll Gavel. This once formed part of the medieval high street which ran between Saturday Market and Butcher Row. It's 12th century in origin and was sometimes called King Street. It once formed part of the main bus route to Hull too. Its name possibly derives from the ancient practice of collecting tolls. Landrus Lane now. In the 19th century this was known as Horns Lane, named after a pub which has long since gone. Historical records indicate that this was alternatively called Laundis Lane in 1633 and Laundrus Lane in 1790, likely both derived from a family of the same name. Champney Road is another named after someone. It's hard to miss these massive offices on the left here. They belong to East Riding of Yorkshire Council and form part of the massive County Hall complex. We'll see the magnificent frontage of that building shortly. Over the road is one of Beverley's best known buildings. Here you're looking at an old public library which forms part of a much bigger building that's housing an art gallery. We know that building today as the Treasure House. The original Grade 2 listed building was designed by the architect John Cash. Pictured outside on a temporary wall is John Edward Champney. Beverly born, Champney was a businessman and benefactor who made his fortune in the textile industry. He donated money for the public library and in 1929 he bequeathed paintings to the art gallery's collection, mainly works by contemporary British artists. Now handily we've got a map here which uh, will show you where we've been and where we've still got to go. So I'll just move the camera so you can see the entire map because I'm not quite sure you... <laughs> now we are currently there outside the library and the art gallery of course and over here we've got the guild hall and the county hall which is the next thing we're going to see along uh, cross street. Now what we've done effectively is we've come from down here through Fleming Gate around Beverly Minster and all around this area here and come through the town centre. So we've still got all this bit to cover yet. There's loads of things out here. It's still quite a long way to walk, but it is a big town after all. Let's continue and see what else Beverly's got. So to the County Hall, which is the headquarters of the East Riding of Yorkshire Council. It's another Grade 2 listed building. Following the implementation of the Local Government Act in 1888, it became necessary to find a meeting place for the East Riding's Council. Initially, meetings were held in the Sessions House and in the Guildhall. After deciding that both of these buildings were inadequate for their needs, county leaders chose to procure a new county headquarters, and this site in Cross Street, which had previously been occupied by a former mechanics institute, was chosen. We turn around now onto Lord Roberts Road, and that's the Magistrates Court. Next door to this is a small theatre, which occupies a converted Baptist chapel. As a religious building, it originally opened in 1910. It stopped being used as such in 1964. It's been a theatre since 2014. Opposite these are the Frederick Roberts Memorial Gardens. These are today named after a hero of the South Africa War, but originally they were created in 1951 for the Festival of Britain. These are best viewed in the summertime when the flowers are in full bloom. The colour theme changes annually. Now we're in another market square. This is Wednesday Market, and although smaller than Saturday, this one can't be overlooked. When Beverly was granted its market charter, it was this small triangular square in the shadow of the Minster where it was held first, before moving to Saturday Market later. Wednesday Market used to be much larger than what it is today. Shops and businesses around its edge led to its decline in the 1400s. That said, Wednesday is still going. It was originally called Fish Market. In a similar way, Saturday was instead known as Corn Market. Here's yet another pub. Must be an ideal place for a pub crawl, this. That one's the angel on the edge of Wednesday Market. So we're going to continue along this pedestrian ice street. It forks into two pieces after the angel. We'll take the left hand fork, but then we're going to take a right turn back up towards uh, a Unitarian church. So uh, still plenty more to see in this town centre yet. Here's that fork in the road. 
To the left is the southern portion of Tollgavel, and to the right it's Walkergate. Let's head to the left first of all. For the most part, the rest of Tollgavel is a series of shops and businesses. It's a mixture of both household names and independent traders, which stretches the length of this pedestrianised area back to Saturday Market. Down here there's the likes of Boots, Clarks, Body Care, Mountain Warehouse and Savers. Beverly isn't short of anything when it comes to modern shopping. Let's take that right turn now, but it's not down any sort of street. This is Golden Ball Passage, which is about the same size and width as Narrow Racket. I've no idea whether any dodgy deals were ever conducted in this one, but I do know a bit about its name. The Golden Ball was a pub and it had its very own brewery. It was owned by Robert Stevenson and it stood on Tollgavel in 1797. Golden Ball Passage is often called Woolies Passage because after the pub and brewery had been demolished, a Woolworth store occupied the site. This narrow lane has been in existence for at least 150 years and its path still runs between Walkergate and Tollgavel where the brewery once stood. Now on Walkergate, here's Tollgavel Unitarian Church. The Italian-style front of this building faces Tollgavel as the name suggests. It was built between 1890 and 92 by Morley and Woodhouse of Bradford to replace the former Walkergate Chapel. It's mainly made of red brick and has around 900 seats. Moving on, this plaque is on the wall at 71 Walkergate. It tells us about the Victorian industrialist William Crosskill, who lived here from 1853 until 1886. Crosskill was known for making prize-winning agricultural machinery, gas lamp standards and cast iron gates at his works in Mill Lane. Now we already know a little bit about art, don't we, thanks to the Champneys um, collection at the Treasure House, but here there's a painting by somebody else. This is by Frederick W. Elwell. It's called The Girl with a Kitten. Uh, the artist himself lived between 1870 and 1958 and that is apparently one of his most popular paintings. It's on the end of a, a house which is right on the end of Walker Gate. And if I turn the camera around here you can see where we're heading next. We're going over there over this crossroads and to the left just there is the town's Tesco. The fact that a Tesco exists in Beverly is a bit of a miracle. Because Bevelovians love their ancient and thriving markets, the idea of a brand new supermarket opening up in the late 1990s was met with fierce pushbacks. Nonetheless, it was eventually built, and the market is still as lively as ever. Via a path right through the supermarket's car park, we find ourselves on Norwood. Opposite us here are buildings that belong to Beverly High School. It's a girls' comprehensive, which was founded in 1908. One of its houses is named after the engineer, Hilda Lyon, who attended this very school. Next it's the Durham Ox. Like all the others we've seen with the same name, this too is titled after the legendary gigantic ox bred in Durham in around 1800. The building though is older, likely 18th century. There are two different levels of roofline either side of its chimney stack, suggesting a single property within a longer terrace was expanded at some point. It became a corner property in 1937 with the demolition of three houses for the development of Corporation Road. Further up Norwood you'll come to a rather nondescript looking lane on the left hand side, but this is worth stopping at. The lane leads to Norwood Recreation Ground, Beverly's main sports complex. Football, tennis and cricket are all played here. Beverly Town are currently members of the Northern Counties East League Premier Division. They've existed since 1902, when the club first registered as a member of the East Riding County League. That club was forced to disband in 1914 upon declaration of World War I, and although they reformed afterwards, it wasn't until the year 2000 when the current club came into existence as a founder member of the Humber Premier League. And the other notable feature on Norwood is this Methodist church built in 19. Oh, one. Now we're going to take a right turn along a road that loops back towards the town centre but what we're doing here is effectively we're heading for the railway station so we're not going back into the town we're still going away from it we're just making a sort of detour if you like towards the railway let's check that out. This is Mill Lane where William Crossskill would have made those cast iron gates and whatnot in his heyday. Mill Lane is a bit of a backwater these days but still has some interesting landmarks. This is Danton's, for example, who make fireplaces and stoves. A bit further down the road there's a petrol station, but generally it's residential on this first stretch until you get to a junction with Cherry Tree Lane. There you'll come to the only halo therapy business in Yorkshire. 
Halo therapy uses microparticles of salt to promote better breathing, healthier skin, sounder sleep, and overall wellness. Next to that is a level crossing where the Yorkshire coastline makes an appearance. This is the first hint that there's a railway station coming up. Before that though, we have the job centre. This occupies Crosskill House, named in honour of the man who would have spent his working life in this area. Crosskill's mill was just off Mill Lane, not actually on it. These flats make reference to the mill. It's an assisted living residence complex and it's called Miller's. Rounding off Mill Lane, we have the new Harvest Church on the corner of Morton Lane, a pillar of faith in the town for many, many years. Now we're on Trinity Lane. This row of houses, Railway Terrace, have backyards which adjoin the car park for Beverley Railway Station. Like many others on the Yorkshire coastline, Beverley was opened in 1846 by the York and North Midland Railway. The original station building was designed by G.T. Andrews. Beverley gained junction status in 1865 when the North Eastern Railway completed their line to Market Wheaton. There was also supposed to be a junction here for the North Holderness Light Railway. The act for it was passed in 1899, but the line was never built. OK, we're about to cross the railway line again in a moment to take us back to the other side of Beverley. Just before we do that, though, there's this nice little square outside the front of the train station with this fabulous clock tower. Doesn't that look fantastic? It's gone very dark here all of a sudden. I'm sure this would look better in bright sunshine. It was about 20 minutes ago, but for some reason, British weather has decided to be changeable today. So, uh, yeah, unfortunately, it's gone rather dark. Never mind, never mind. Let's continue over the railway line, past Fleming Gate again, and we'll head towards what is our final section of this walk around Beverley. Now, at this point, I could have just walked over the level crossing and past the signal box, but we can do better than that. Instead, I opted to walk through the station and over this gorgeous iron bridge linking the two platforms. This also allows us to see the inside of the fabulous Victorian canopy over the line itself. Beverley is a pretty easy place to reach via the railway. This station is served by two trains an hour to Hull and Bridlington, with an hourly service to Scarborough on weekdays. Most services to Hull continue to Doncaster and Sheffield, or Selby and York. Let's cross the line now and move on. Here's the back of Fleming Gate, and you might just be able to make out the Beverley campus of the East Riding College there. They moved to Fleming Gate after their previous site was sold for a brand new housing development. We're following Grove Hill Road now towards a small park, which does a great job of reminding us that Beverley is a fair trade town. Lining the back of this green space, we have the old St Nicholas's School. Built in 1914, it's now surplus to requirements according to East Riding's Council, and was put up for sale after a brand new school, costing £5 million, was opened nearby. Historically speaking, the eastern side of Beverley was in the church parish of St Nicholas. There was an original St Nicholas's church, but it was pulled down 200 years ago. The current building was consecrated in 1880 as a memorial to the family of Lord Wolverton. It was designed by Broderick and built by Simpsons and Malone, with its woodwork undertaken by Elwell of Beverley. Its font, though, is thought to be from the original St Nicholas's Church. Lastly, behind this church is the new St Nicholas's School, which occupies the site of a former infant's building. And if you walk down the street that's dead opposite the church, you're back to Beverly Beckside. And there behind me is the Forester's Arms, which has always been, on this route, the planned finishing point. There we go. We are all the way around the route in Beverly. All I've got to do now is make my way back to Figham Road, where I actually began the walk, but there's nothing much more to film there because you've already seen it. Now, of course, there are some other things in Beverly that this video hasn't captured, and the reason for that is because they're actually over the parish boundaries. You'll remember, of course, the shipbuilding yard. That's actually in the Ticton episode. You need that if you want to go and learn a bit about the shipbuilding in Beverly. The uh, Beverly Grammar School is in Woodmansey, which we covered last week, and there's a few other bits and bobs which aren't actually in Beverly's boundaries. They're in other parishes but you know you just have to go and watch some of my other videos won't you having said all that i will now do a little bit of a drive around to catch some remaining features including the hospital and a few other bits and bobs enjoy there are plenty of housing estates around the town center the likes of those in molescroft and on kelgate park are within other parishes of course but beverly has some of its own 
The eastern side of the town is dominated by them, and this one is off Hullbridge Road. It features a pub called The Highfield. It began life as just another private residence, but later became a country club. It's had a few names too. Lots of people will remember this as the Eager Beaver, a reference to Beverly's coat of arms. Now we're off down Coltman Avenue. This is named after the Reverend Joseph Coltman, once the perpetual curate of Beverly Minster. He's usually remembered today for his enormous bulk, and he used to ride around town on a hobby horse velocipede, a type of bicycle. A few years before his death, he weighed in at 37 stone 8 pounds. It has been said that presumably after the death of the 53 stone Daniel Lambert in 1809, Coltman would have, by default, become the heaviest man in England. According to an undated early 20th century article in the Criterion magazine on remarkable East Riding characters, Coltman is said to have sought to master his obese inclination in early life through constant walking, but without avail. When unaided walking became impossible, the Velocipede allowed him to keep on the move. Off Coltman Avenue is Salmon Road, which has a row of shops and a pharmacy. It's defined mainly by its tall flats that tower over the road below. The street is named after Sir Henry Salmon. He was employed by the Wilson Shipping Company, headed by Arthur Wilson of Tranby Croft. He lived in Beverly for a time, and in 1907 he would purchase the entire estate of Routh from the Earl of Lonsborough. Salmon was a man of great wealth and lived out his final years at Willoughby Manor. He died in 1928. Now we're on Neville Avenue. As far as I'm aware, this isn't named after any specific Bevelovian, but it is worth mentioning the Neville name. If you're a Neville, the chances are you're related to a former Archbishop of York. George Neville held that title in 1460 and had several connections with Beverly. A left turn at the end and you're on Grove Hill Road, heading for what's often been dubbed the craziest junction in the UK. Grove Hill Junction has a staggering 42 sets of traffic lights, prompting some locals to term it the Red Light District. I made a Tales from the Village Green about this. Look out for it, it's linked in today's end screen. Lastly, on Swinemoor Lane, it's the East Riding Community Hospital. This was built to replace the ageing Westwood Hospital. It was constructed by Interserve at a cost of £19 million and opened in July of 2012. In early 2015, the number of beds provided was increased from 26 to 36 to meet a surge in demand. Westwood Hospital was originally the Beverly Union Workhouse and dated from the 1860s. It was a red brick Tudor-style building designed by John and William Atkinson of York. And that's really it. There are plenty of other areas we could also drive around, but this video is already pretty lengthy. Besides, in terms of major landmarks, we've just about covered the lot. Under any normal circumstances, we'd be wrapping this episode up now, but this is a special one, so there's still a little more. After a change of clothing, because by this point I'd worked up quite a sweat, I returned to Saturday Market. I wasn't planning on buying anything though. Instead, I was here to meet a few people who wanted to see me and have a little chat about the East Riding series. I'm pleased to report my efforts, unlike with Selby and Leeds, didn't go unrewarded. More on that shortly though. With a little time to kill first, I thought it would be a good idea to do a little walk through the market now that it was in full swing. So here's a three minute wander around. There's no music, it's ASMR style. I'm going to 
Well, here's something I didn't cover earlier on the main walk. You remember Narrow Racket, don't you? Well, here, not far away from Narrow Racket, there's another street with a great name. This is called Old Waste, and you can see that's where HSBC Bank is. And I'm going to wait here because it's right opposite the Market Cross. There's meant to be someone coming to see me in about 20 minutes or so. So I'll uh, just make myself comfortable close to this and uh, wait and see who turns up. And indeed, people did come. I met with no less than four followers before I left the town centre. Selfies were taken, laughs were had, memories were made. In this picture, that's Beverly native Heather and her husband, two of the biggest followers of the East Riding series from almost the beginning. But that's not all. I was just about to leave Beverly, and I got as far as the Westwood heading for the bypass, when I got a message from Carmina and Ivor, who'd travelled the 15 or so miles across the county from Hornsey, just to see me. I had to stop because these two and their dog are TVI superfans. It was great to meet them too. Lastly, the plan was to do a video montage through some local villages to wrap up the county. The weather though had other ideas, so instead it was plan B. Thank you so much to all the East Riding people who have watched, liked, supported and commented. Thank you for making this county such a pleasure to cover.
thanks for watching this video folks don't forget to like this episode if you haven't already it really makes a difference with youtube if you're new here subscribe to the channel for more videos like this and give us a share too if you've got friends who'd like it you can find all the links to my social media accounts below as well as my buy me a coffee page where you can donate to the channel also if you've enjoyed this episode have a look at some more videos in this series until next time i've been andy also known as the village idiot and i'm out